has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. If you have your Bibles, you could turn to Genesis chapter 2. I'll be reading verses 5 through 17. Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 through 17. We read, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon, it is the one that flowed around all the land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. And the name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flowed east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. This evening, I've entitled our message, The Temple City. The Temple City, we're going to be taking a look at the land of Eden as it's described, and we're going to be comparing it to temple imagery and making the argument that Genesis Um, that Eden is a temple city. And now when you were coming in, I had my wife hand out these. If uh, you didn't get them, uh, where'd you leave them? By the sound booth. If you'd like to grab one, they're there by the sound booth. This is just uh, an outline of some questions for you to fill in. Pastor Gene had done this this morning, and uh, Pastor Stephen had asked me for some discussion questions for afterwards. And so I thought, well, let's just print off one of these for you, and you can follow along and fill that out if you would like. So far, as we've been going through the book of Genesis, we've been following the Toledot structure. There's a phrase that's repeated throughout Genesis uh, 11 times. These are the generations. We see this in the section we're at right now, which is section 1, which takes place in Genesis 2, 4. It says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. And what this heading gives us is it tells us that it's about... It's going to be about Adam and then those who come after him. And so we're in the first section of the book, and we finished up the introduction, which is chapter 1, giving us this overview of Genesis. We've been looking through what creation tells us. The creation tells us many things, and it gives us much knowledge about who God is, his attributes, and his characteristics. It's not just, here's how you were formed, here's where your origin is, but it also tells us who God is, who is this God that we worshiped. And so we're continuing today to look at how God is relational, as chapter 2 is really honing in on this process that God is a relational God, whereas chapter 1 gives us this broad overview of God as an all-powerful God, and we went through the other points so far. But many of the other points that we went through we'll also see here in chapter 2. And so this is sort of where we've been going through over the past number of weeks, but I have a question for you. What is God's purpose in building Eden? What is God's purpose in building Eden? A temple? A place for man. A place for man. Yeah, a temple, a place for man, a paradise, a a relational place where God can come and dwell with man. God is building this place in Eden, and it all drives us to this point that Eden is a temple city. And as the title of this message states, that that is where we're going to be going this evening and looking at how Eden is a temple city with the language used. A couple quotes for you from commentators on this. J.R. Middleton says, suppose we press the question, what sort of building is God making in Genesis chapter 1? Although not immediately obvious, the unequivocal answer given from the perspective of the rest of the Old Testament is this, God is building a temple. 
J.H. Walton says, On the seventh day, we finally discover that God has been working to achieve a rest. The seventh day is not a theological appendix to the creation account, just to bring closure now that the main events of creating people has been reported. Rather, it intimates the purpose of creation and of the cosmos. God does not set up the cosmos so that only people will have a place. He also sets up the cosmos to serve as his temple in which he will find rest in the order and equilibrium that he has created. Basically making the argument that Eden and this place that God has created is a temple for him to dwell in and have this relationship with man. And this connects well with the topic when we discuss the image of God. What is the image of God? It is man is created as a royal priesthood. And I argue that there's three main points. I, I lay, lay this out a little bit differently to, to get that point. But three main aspects of the image of God is the ability to rule. That man was created as a priesthood to mediate between God and creation within that rule and this aspect of sonship. And because these three things are what the image of God is, it must follow the latter four there, that man has morality, that they have choice to be able to follow and love God, that they have a relationship with the God who is cre- whom, whose image they were created, that they have intelligence and reason to make these decisions as God had commanded Adam to name all the beasts of the field. And they're also, as the word image says, they are to reflect God's characteristics. But all of these are based off of this, this image like they reflect God's characteristics as a royal priesthood. And so you have Eden as this temple, and so then it naturally makes sense that mankind is created in Eden as a priesthood, as a royal priesthood, or a kingly priesthood, you could say. T. Desmond Alexander says, interpreting against their ancient Near Eastern background, the opening chapters of Genesis anticipate that God's plan for the earth centers on the creation of an extraordinary temple city where God will dwell in harmony with humanity. To this end, humans are given a royal and priestly status with the expectation that they will be God's vice regents on the earth making this same argument a royal priesthood. They are given this command to rule and to be a priesthood before God and creation. This also plays into the comparison between Genesis 1 and 2. And Dr. Andy Woods had this slide in his lecture on this, which he got from Wilkinson and Bo. The difference is in focus on Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 and how their parallel accounts are not, they're not contradictory, but Genesis 1 focuses on God as a creator God, Genesis 2, covenant keeper God. You see the difference in names, Elohim, Yahweh, a powerful God, a personal God, God of the universe, God of man. Genesis 1 climaxes with marriage, Genesis... Genesis 1 climaxes with man, and Genesis 2 climaxes with marriage. And the six days of creation are Genesis 1, and Genesis 2 focuses on the sixth day of creation with the creation of man and what it looks like for man to be created in the image of God, as well as this focus on Eden being this temple city. T. Desmond Alexander goes on to comment on this. He says, Remarkably, in spite of differing in content and literary style, the two accounts are united by the idea that God, uh, united by the idea that the earth has been created to become God's dwelling place. Several weeks ago, first week in January, we discussed the question why does God rest? If God is is a being, an all-powerful being who does not get tired, who does not get weary, why does God rest? And we looked into how he patterns the Sabbath. To expand on that a little more, there's another reason why God rests. It is a picture of him dwelling in his temple. It's a picture of him dwelling in his temple. When he finished creation, he declared it very good. Then he goes on to rest, which gives a picture that he has then gone down into his creation to dwell there and rest from his work that he has done because it is completed. And so why does God rest? It is patterning for the Sabbath. It is patterning for man, but it is also a picture of him dwelling in his temple because Eden is a temple city. Now, after going all through that and making all these claims, Eden is a temple city, and these commentators that are saying Eden is a temple city, where do we get this concept that Eden is a temple city? And this comes from, as one commentator noted in one of the quotes that we read, there are many parallels and patterns throughout the Bible of this. Eden is a parallel to the temple and the tabernacle. Eden is a parallel to the temple and the tabernacle. 
As Wenham says, many of the features of the garden may also be found in later sanctuaries, particularly the tabernacle or Jerusalem temple. These parallels suggest that the garden itself is understood as a sort of sanctuary. A sanctuary being very much involved in the same in line with a temple. And so how is Eden and the temple and the tabernacle parallels? Well, Eden is a place where God's presence is known. In Genesis 3.8, it says, As, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So God's very presence came into the garden to dwell with Adam and Eve to have this relationship with them. You also see the same with the tabernacle. It is a place where God's presence is known. Isaiah 40, 34, Exodus 40, 34 says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And this passage goes on to say that the glory was so intense that no one, including Moses himself, could enter the tabernacle at that time because of God's presence that poured out on the tabernacle. When we read in 1 Kings chapter 8 or chapter 10, it says the exact same thing, that when the temple was finished, God's glory filled the temple, a symbol of his presence. In Eden, we see it as a place where God dwells. That same passage in Genesis 3 talks about him being present in the garden. It is a place where he would dwell with Adam and Eve. We see the same with the temple and the tabernacle. As Psalm 132.14 alludes to, it says, This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. Eden is a place where the Lord walks. The Lord walks in Eden, as Genesis 3.8 says, When they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, we also get the same imagery with the temple. Leviticus 26, 12, I will make my dwelling among you and my soul shall not abhor you and I will walk among you and I will be your God and you shall be my people. What is the ultimate symbol of this? It was the tabernacle, the place where God dwells. Eden and creation focuses in seven days, and there's also this focus on two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, and you have this focus on the seven days within that. In the temple, in the tabernacle, there was a menorah, which symbolized this. The seven branches of a a menorah uh, are believed to symbolize creation, and a menorah is shaped like a tree. As you can see here, the seven branches came out, and when they describe the menorah and the way it is created, it is described as if they are, as if it is a tree. And so you have this, this connection with the tree as well. In Eden, there's a river that flows out of it. As we read, a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. In the temple that Ezekiel speaks about, which is a temple in the future, it gives this same picture as well. Ezekiel 47.1, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced the east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple south of the altar. You have as well, in Eden, gold and onyx are in the land. As we we read in in Genesis 2 there, there there's two places given where gold and onyx are plentiful, and it says there, the gold is good, giving this picture that gold isn't something that is inherently corrupt, and money isn't something that is inherently corrupt, but it is how we perceive money, what we do with money. But gold and onyx are plentiful in the land. This is also connected to the tabernacle because gold and onyx are used extensively to decorate the later sanctuaries and priestly garments. You have as well, Eden was built on a mountain on high ground. As some will argue out of Ezekiel 28, the last two lines, I placed you, you are on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. As well, the temple was built on on higher ground in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is the, one of the highest places there. It is a high elevation. It is considered to be the high, high ground mountain-like state. God's holy mountain, that verse we read in Ezekiel, called Eden and made reference to Eden as God's holy mountain. 
And the temple is also called God's holy mountain in connection with Zion, Jerusalem, because the temple is there. Psalm 2, 6, as for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Why is Zion, why is Jerusalem this, this focus place? It's because that is where the temple is. Same in Joel three seventeen. you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. In Eden, you would enter the garden through the east. As we read in Genesis 3, 24, when they are kicked out of the garden, it says, He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So I've drawn up a picture here. This is sort of the way that Eden is described. You have have the tan there is outside Eden. And you have there on the east side, you come from the east, so you're going west, and you would enter into the larger area of Eden, and then within Eden, you have the garden, and within the garden, you have in the center there the tree of life. And so you enter from the east into Eden. The same is true with the temple and with the tabernacle. The entrance, you would come from the east. You would be traveling going west, but from the east, you would enter as we read in Exodus 27, 13, the breadth of the court on the front, the front of the tabernacle to the east shall be 50 cubits. Ezekiel 8, 16, it says, And he brought me to the inner court of the house of the Lord, and behold, at the entrance of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs to the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, worshiping the sun towards the east. So if their backs are towards the temple and they're facing east, that's saying that you would enter the temple through the east. And then again, we read of this future temple that Ezekiel describes. It says, for the temple faced east. And so here's a picture of the temple, and you can see it's this same kind of layout. You have the east there, and you would come in from the east as you would proceed into the tabernacle or the temple as it later became. We also see that Eden is guarded by cherubim. In Genesis 3, 24, it says, When he drove, the man, uh, he drove out the man at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim. He placed the cherubim. And so there's a cherubim guarding the east. You also have the cherubim guarding in the temple on the Ark of the Covenant. It says, You shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work. You shall make them on the two ends of the mercy seats. And so you have the cherubim there on the Ark of the Covenant with their wings outstretched on the mercy seat. The mercy seat literally translated in the Hebrew as the covering. The covering. And it's this picture of this place where God dwells, where God sits, going back to how the temple is a picture of God's presence. But you see both cherubim guarding Eden and cherubim guarding the Ark of the Covenant because not anybody can go in and touch the Ark of the Covenant. That was reserved for the high priest once a year under very special circumstances that he must have qualified, that he must qualify for. We see in Eden, Adam served a priestly role. You can look at the reference in Genesis 1.28. You see that the, you see the Aaronic priesthood. So you have a priesthood in, in both places. The royal priesthood is more accurate for it. And the same is true with the Aaronic priesthood. They were to be a priest of kingdom, uh, a kingdom of priests, a royal priesthood. Exodus 19.6, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. You have very similar language used for it. Adam and Eve are to work, avad, and to keep shamar, the garden. I've highlighted these words, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it, avad, and to keep it, shamar. These same words are used for the priests when they serve and keep the temple. In Numbers chapter 3, they shall keep guard, shamar, over him and over the whole congregation before the tent of meeting as they minister of Odd at the, ta- at the tabernacle. And so the similar language is used for both Adam and Eve as well as the priests with the tabernacle and the temple. And you have the further in you go, for both of these in Eden and the tabernacle and the temple, the further in you go, the closer to life, holiness, and God you get. So going back to this picture, you come in from the east and you have that outer region of Eden. And so Eden wasn't something that was global. It didn't cover the entire earth, but just a portion of the earth. And so Adam and Eve could go outside of Eden if they wanted to explore the earth and they could go back into Eden. 
But Eden was this larger land within the earth, but within the land of Eden, you also have this garden that God planted. And within the garden, you have the tree of life. And so the further that you go into Eden, the closer you get to the tree of life. The same is true with the tabernacle and with the temple. You have outside of the tabernacle where most people would dwell. Most people were not allowed to go into the tabernacle or into certain sections of the tabernacle. So you have this outside area like you did in Eden. Then you have the outer courtyard. And then as you go further into the tabernacle, you go into the holy place. And further in, you go into the Holy of Holies. And as I said, that was reserved for the high priest once a year if he met the circumstances and he was clean when he went in there and he went through the sacrifices needed to go in there to do the sacrificial offering for Israel once a year at Yom Kippur. And so you have this picture of the tabernacle that the further you go into it, the further you get to holiness, that you get to where God dwells, And in a way, you get to life. Now, if you are corrupt and you go into that place where there is life, you will only find death because you go in corrupt. But if you go in under blood, this even takes us to the new covenants, if you go in under blood, the high priest was able to make sacrifices. This is also pictured, interestingly enough, at Sinai. At Sinai. Moses goes up on Sinai to receive this covenant. And the further you go up the mountain of Sinai, the closer you get to life, holiness, and God. And so you had the people at the bottom, and they were commanded, do not go. Even at the base of the mountain, do not climb it at all, you or beast, because if you do, you will die. But then there were some who were allowed further up the mountain, like Joshua was allowed further up the mountain, so much so that when Israel was worshiping the calf god, Joshua was high enough up on the mountain that he could not see what Israel was doing, but only heard the cries and thought that war had broken out. But the top of the mountain where Moses received the covenant was reserved for Moses alone. And we can take this back to the tabernacle language. The people are on the bottom. They are outside You have the outer courtyard being the base of the mountain. You have Joshua reflected as the holies and Moses reflected as the holy of holies. And so then when we have the tabernacle, in essence, it's taking the mountain and putting it on its side. And so the further up you go the mountain, the closer you get, you tilt it to the side. The further in that you go from the east, the closer you get. And the same is true with Eden. Now, Eden is unique, isn't it? Because there's no sin. There's no sin. Whereas with Sinai and with the tabernacle, there was a sin barrier. But Adam and Eve were free to go in as they pleased. They were free to go to the tree of life when they wanted and eat of it. They had that freedom because there was no sin. And so Eden was unique in this aspect that there was this perfect presence, but there was still in the middle of the garden, the tree of life, which symbolized life, holiness, and God's presence. We also have in Eden, Eden is declared good. And God saw everything that he'd made, and behold, it was very good. This includes Eden, the temple city. There's an argument that the tabernacle and the temple are also declared good. In Exodus 39, 43, it says, And Moses saw all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. So they had done it, then Moses blessed them. And you may be looking at this passage and maybe saying, Aiden, I don't see the word good in here. Where is the declaration, it is good? Well, let's take a moment to understand what God means when he says it's very good. When God says it's very good, he he is in one sense giving a blessing to it. What does Moses do? He blesses. There's a blessing aspect to it. There's also this aspect that it's, it's completed, that it's finished. There's nothing lacking to it. It's satisfactory. It's not that God needs to create more to make this better. We see that with Adam and Eve. It was not good for man to be alone. It's not good. Does that mean it's sinful? No, it means that it's incomplete. It's not satisfactory. And so God creates Eve out of man. And after that, God says, it is very good. It is satisfactory. It is complete. It is pleasing to me. And so when we get the description given here, and Moses saw all the work and behold that they had done as the Lord commanded, so they had done it. Then Moses blessed them. It gives this picture that the work is completed. They don't need to build another altar. They don't need to build another 
another tabernacle. They don't need to build another menorah. Any of the objects, it's completed. And so you have this aspect of it being good and up to the specifications and the satisfaction that God gave. And we can see this because why? When they finished it, God's presence came and dwelled within the tabernacle. Along the same lines, both are declared finished. Genesis 2, 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, all the host of them, same with the tabernacle. Thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished. And the people of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so they did. You also have an aspect of rest after the completion. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. And you have the same is true, the same aspect of rest after completion in Psalm 132, verse 14, where God says, this is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it, giving us this picture that God desires to rest and to be with man. And as we stated earlier, why does God rest? Well, it's a picture of him dwelling. Psalm 134, 14 gives this connection. And so here are 17 reasons why Eden is a temple city and the parallels between the tabernacle and the temple. And we could go on. The list goes much further. A man wrote a 300-page book on this very topic. I have not read it, so I can't recommend it. And how accurate it is, I don't I don't know. I haven't looked too much into it. But there is a lot of work that people have done in comparing these two to say Eden is a temple city. But this takes me to another question. What is a temple? We've talked about how Eden is a temple city in these parallels, but, but what is a temple? What is, a, what is the purpose of the temple? We've answered some of these. A temple is a place of God's presence. It's a place of God's presence and paralleled with that, the place where God dwells. It's a place on earth. Eden was a place of paradise. And so God could freely walk with man in the garden because there was no sin. In the tabernacle and the temple, it's more restricted, isn't it? Because of our sin. And so we can't just march into the dwelling of God. And if a priest did that, he would be struck dead. And so it is a place of God's presence and it is a place where God dwells. But because of our sin, there were restrictions on going into the place where God dwells. There's also, in a sense, it being a a gateway, and I didn't quite know what word to use here. Some will say, uh, we'll use the word gateway. Some will use a portal. Some will say the place where heaven meets earth. It's sort of this concept where you have God dwells in heaven, but then you have this aspect where earth is also God's footstool, but where is that the place where that is shown most? It is the temple in the Old Testament. And so some will make the argument and say, oh, it's like a gateway or a portal. And it reminds me of the, the song. It's possibly the, uh, one of the weirdest Christian song lyrics that, that I've heard in a worship song uh, from How He Loves. When heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss. And David Crowder changed that to, uh, to an unforeseen kiss. But they're trying to get this picture that's Heaven meeting earth is the sense where God dwells. And when he's referring to that, he's referring to the incarnation. But the temple gives this picture of this gateway between heaven and earth where God dwells and God's presence is known. And lastly, it is a sanctuary. The temple is a sanctuary. What is a sanctuary? There's two aspects to this. It's a safe place. And during the, I believe it was the Middle Ages... If somebody was, the law was trying to capture somebody, uh, somebody could go into a church and say, I declare sanctuary. I declare this a a safe place where I I cannot be killed. The law cannot come in here and harm me until my sanctuary is foregone or whatever laws they had around that. But the whole point behind it was you can go to the church, go into the building and declare sanctuary as a safe place. There's a sense where the temple is a safe place. At the same time, there's a sense where the temple is not a safe place at all because of our sin. But a a sanctuary and the aspect of that is a safe place. The second aspect of that is it's a place of worship. What do we call the area that we are in right now? It's a sanctuary. We call it a sanctuary. Why do we call it a sanctuary? Because it's a place where we worship. What is the temple? The temple is a sanctuary. What do they do at the temple? They offer sacrifices. Is it just for forgiveness? 
No, that's for only two of the five routine sacrifices and not even for all of the festival sacrifices. There are a lot more sacrifices. You have the whole burnt offering. That is a sacrifice of thanksgiving. You have the grain offering. That is a sacrifice of thanksgiving. You have the peace offering, which is a sacrifice of worship and thanksgiving. And there's some more connections to that. There's different aspects to the peace offering. But the point is, you have these sacrifices that are taking place in the temple daily, and not all of them are for sin. Many of them are for thanksgiving. And so the sanctuary is a place of worship. But even the sacrifices that are meant for sin are also a place of worship. Here is how I have failed God. I repent. Please forgive me. It is an aspect of worship that we're saying, I want to be closer to you, God. I want to have this right relationship with you. I want to worship you. And so you would bring your sin offering. If you didn't care what God thought about you, if you didn't care about having this relationship with God, why go through the expense of bringing this offering? And as you read through Leviticus, the the offerings aren't the same for everyone. A rich man would have to bring a more expensive offering for a sin offering, a bull. Somebody who is less wealthy would have to bring something like a goat. And somebody who is very poor would only have to bring a very cheap bird. But for everybody, it costs something. And it doesn't just cost money, but it also costs the time. It also, in many ways, can cost the humiliation of going there before all of your brothers and say, I have sinned. I need forgiveness from the Lord. Here is my offering. And so the the temple is a place of sanctuary. It's a safe place, but it's also a place of worship. Though we don't have the sin aspect in Eden, the same is true. It is a a safe place, and it is also a place of worship. But as soon as Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, was it a safe place for them? Was it a place where they could dwell? Was it a place where they could worship? No, because God cast them out from his presence. Wenham says, The Garden of Eden is not viewed by the author of Genesis simply as a piece of Mesopotamian farmland, but as an archetypal sanctuary that is a place where God dwells, where man should worship him. Many of the features of the garden may also be found in later sanctuaries, particularly the tabernacle or Jerusalem temple. We read that portion already, but he ends by saying, these parallels would suggest that the garden itself is understood as a sort of sanctuary. It's a sanctuary. And in the Greek, you have the word that we translate garden, but the word literally is where we get the word paradise from. It was a paradise for Adam and Eve And it's interesting when we look in Revelation chapter 2 to the church in Ephesus, when he tells them that he will let them eat from the tree of life to the ones who overcome, which is in the paradise of God, it's the same word used, which is in the garden of God, this paradise, this sanctuary, this safe place. But as I said, when Adam and Eve sinned, Adam and Eve were cast out of God's temple city because of their sin, because they had transgressed. And just like how we see later with the temple and with the tabernacle, the further in you go, the further you get to holiness, but the the sinner that you are restricts you from being able to go in. And so for that reason, Adam and Eve were cast out of God's temple city. And so we looked into what is a temple. And when we think of a temple, we, we generally associate that with priests, right? So when we think of temple, we think of priestly service. And that while that is true, it is, it is lacking in a way. And so I have a question for you. What are the three offices that we see in Scripture? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I'll explain what I'm talking about. But does anybody know what are the three offices we see in Scripture? Prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, priest, and king are the three offices that we see in the Bible. So let's explain each. What is a prophet? Well, at a very basic level, a prophet is somebody who preaches and preaches about the future. And so he preaches prophetically, meaning it's something about something that has not taken place. And so at the heart of it, a prophet is a preacher, but he's a very specialized preacher. Because a king can be a preacher and say, repent, follow the book of the law. But a prophet is different because he's saying, if you don't follow the book of the law, here's the consequences. Here is what's going to happen to you. You have Isaiah saying, Assyria is coming because of your sin. Repent. You have Jeremiah saying, Babylon is coming because of your sin. Repent. Had they come yet? Pastor Gene talked about that this morning in his introduction into the book of Daniel. 
that God gives these prophecies beforehand. And so you have this office of prophet that God has established. You also have the office of priest. And we, we understand priests who, uh, to a good degree, I think they're the ones who work in the temple, who serve. In essence, a, peace, a priest is a mediator between God and man, or in the garden sense, between God and creation and the future generations that would come. And so a priest is a mediator, and all the work that they do in the temple with the sacrifices, with the offerings, with the gifts and everything, is to say, here is the gift from man to you, God, and what is God's response back to them. And so it is this mediator between God and man. That is a priest and a king. I think kings that we are most familiar with, they are one who rules. And they are one who rules in a monarchy, and we, we understand well the sense of a king. And so you have these three offices, prophet, priest, and king. But in Eden, we see that we are cre- they were created in the image of God, and we are created in the image of God. But in Eden, you see that the image of God is a royal priesthood. It's not a royal priesthood of prophets, is it? Why is that? Why is there no mention of prophets in Eden? It's because Eden is a paradise. Eden is perfection. And so to say that there are prophets in Eden doesn't make any sense. Well, it's the only thing that they would prophesy about the sin that would later take place. When you are in perfection, there is no need for a prophet. The same will be true when we get to the new heavens and the new earth. When we are in paradise with God, there will be no more prophets. As it says in Daniel chapter 9, when discussing the 70 weeks, he will put an end. He will seal up both prophet and vision. Why will he seal that up at the end of days? Because there's no more need for it. Everything has been fulfilled. And so everything that the Bible points to with the prophet is going to be fulfilled by the time we get to the new heavens and the new earth. And when we get there, there is no more need for a prophet. And so when we look at the image of God, we see it's a royal priesthood, but you don't see this aspect of prophet within that because a prophet is something that comes from sin. It comes from, a need, it comes from sin and a need for there to be prophecy of hope and a prophecy of destruction for those who will not repent. And within these roles of prophet, priest, and king, we, we see examples throughout the Bible of people acting in one of these or in two of these or in some aspects even three. But ultimately, who is the true and final, the greatest prophet, priest, and king? It's Jesus. Jesus is our true prophet, priest, and king. How is he the true prophet? How is he the greatest prophet? Well, Moses was a great prophet, wasn't he? Moses did many mighty signs and works for the Lord. He was a great prophet. And yet, twice in Deuteronomy, God prophesies through Moses and says, I will raise up a prophet like you from among your brothers like Moses. One that is like Moses. And Deuteronomy ends by making this comparison that he, this prophet to come, will do innumerable mighty works. Moses did a lot of mighty works. They're recorded for us. But what does John say about Jesus when he closes his letter? What does he say about him? He says, I I, I don't think all the books in the world, you could not have enough books in the world to contain everything that Jesus did because that's how much it was. And what John is saying, look back to the end of Deuteronomy, this greater prophet is Jesus. The same with the priest. What does the author of Hebrews argue? That Jesus is our great high priest under whose order? It's not the order of Aaron. It's not the order of the new covenant. It's under the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is our great high priest. He is the greatest high priest. And Jesus is also king. What was the promise given to David? To your offspring, I will establish his kingdom for a couple hundred years until about the time of the Romans. And when the Romans come into power and take it over and then destroy the temple in 70 AD, then his kingdom will end and it will never be again. Is that the promise to David? The promise to David was your offspring, I will establish his kingdom forever. Forever. Does that have an end point? And when we look throughout the Bible, we see it trying to get back to this picture where when we get to the new heavens and the new earth and even the millennium, Jesus is going to reestablish the Davidic kingdom and reign on that kingdom in Jerusalem forever. And when our current Jerusalem fades away and the new Jerusalem comes, there will still be a kingdom there and Christ will still reign on it because his kingdom will be established forever. And so Jesus is all three, prophet, priest, and king. And Moses, you could make the argument, Moses, 
He is a prophet. Clearly, he is a prophet because the Bible says he's a prophet. I will raise up for you a prophet like Moses. He is most certainly a priest as well. He went to the top of Mount Sinai and mediated between the people after they had sinned with the calf god when they had broken the covenant on the wedding day language that is used on the covenant day when Moses was going to come down. That it was when they were breaking the covenant. Moses goes up and intercedes for them. Moses is clearly a priest. And Moses is judge over all of Israel. He acts very much like a king. We could go with David as well. David is clearly a prophet. David is clearly a prophet. Read the Psalms and there are many messianic Psalms. Psalm 110 being one of them. Speaking messianically, David is clearly a prophet. David is also clearly a king, considering he was the king of Israel. Considering that the Davidic covenant is his offspring, is the future king that comes from his loins, would be a king. So, quite clearly, he is a king. Is David a priest? Well, David ate of the showbread. David did some many priestly things. In fact, Psalm 110 says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. You're a priest forever, David, but also speaking greater messianically of his son, that being Jesus. But is it an order after the order of Aaron? No, David is of the tribe of Judah. He says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath, speaking of his kingship. And David, the one writing this psalm, speaking in some ways about himself, but more so speaking prophetically, Psalm 110 shows David as prophet, priest, and king. But... No one is prophet, priest, and king like Jesus. And so how does this then connect back to the temple? Why why are we going into this topic of prophet, priest, and king? Well, there's an aspect of all three of these within the temple, but mostly the priest and the king, because there's a call to a royal priesthood. The call of the image of God of Imago Dei still stands to us today, doesn't it? It wasn't when Adam and Eve sinned that it was completely destroyed and we are no longer in the image of God. There's still this call to rule. And we talked about that when we went through the image of God. But because of our sin, we now have prophets who are to bring us back to the true worship of Yahweh. The prophets are calling us back to the true worship of Yahweh. In fact, when you look at the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, is laid out differently than our English Bible in the order and you'll see that books like Joshua and Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, are listed as books of the prophets. And then it goes into some of the prophets, but then some of the prophets in our Bible are excluded, like Daniel. Daniel isn't in the Hebrew prophets in the, in the Tanakh. Why is this? Well, it's because the Hebrew Bible, what all the prophetic books are doing is it's trying to point Israel to the Torah. It's saying... Repent, follow God. Do what he has called you to do under this covenant community. And Daniel, though Daniel is a prophet, what is Daniel's main message? It's eschatology. It's the future. And so Daniel is pointing to the future. He's not very much concerned about the Torah, but he's concerned about the coming Messiah. Though the other prophets are concerned about the Messiah, much of their message is based off of Israel has fallen away from the Torah. And they have fallen away from the proper use of worship in the temple. And so a prophet, there are now prophets to lead us back to true worship. A prophet points us back to the path that leads to God's presence. A prophet points us to what it means to be a royal priesthood. And Jesus, Jesus as our true, as our greatest prophet, priest, and king, will lead us into a new temple. And as a prophet, he has told us that that will happen. Let me ask you this question. If the temple is God's place of dwelling, is there one in the new Jerusalem? It's a trick question. Thank you, Fred. And I put a line there in your notes. If you want to write, you could write yes and no, because it is a trick question. Revelation chapter 21, verses 22 through 27. And I saw no temple in the city. So no, there's no temple in the new heavens and the new earth, right? No, well, it says then, for his temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. So though there's no physical temple building, there is still a temple because it is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. It will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it. 
nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. What is this describing? It's describing Eden, the perfection of it. But as I would argue, this is an even greater way than Eden. And so you see that there's also a parallel between Eden and the new heavens and the new earth with its temple being the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. We went through these 17 reasons. We could also add on another column, and I didn't because there's no way you would be able to see it even when I went into the smaller boxes. But Eden was a place where God's presence is known. Is God's presence known in the new heavens and the new earth? Yes, because He is the temple, meaning His presence is continually there. And I would argue that this, as well as the place where God dwells, the place where God walks within this is in an even greater way than Eden. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, you get the imagery that God was not currently with them at that time. And then they ate of the fruits. And then they hid themselves. And then the Lord God's presence came into the garden and they heard him walking in the cool of the day. And so you get this, this picture that is a little bit different compared to what we get in the new heavens and the new earth, with them being the temple. And as 1 Thessalonians 4 says, when speaking about the rapture, it says, for we will always be with him. It's not we will be with him for a little time and then he will go away and then he will return. We will always be with him. So whether he is in heaven and we are dead before then or raptured before then, we will go up to be with him in heaven. But when he comes down at the second coming and establishes his kingdom, we come with him because we will be with him. And it'll be like that forever. And so the new temple, that being the Lord God and the Lamb, is a place where God's presence is known. It's a place where God dwells. It's a place where he walks. You see the symbolism of the tree of life. What is in the new Jerusalem? The tree of life. And Pastor Tim is going to speak on that with you next week. You see this river flowing out of Eden. What flows through the new Jerusalem? A river. Golden onyx are used extensively in the temple. What are the streets paved with? Gold. Gold in the new heavens and the new earth. The temple was built on the high ground. The same would be true. God's holy mountain, the ultimate God's holy mountain, is the new created Zion, the new Jerusalem. You're guarded by cherubim. Well, this one is one where it falls short, doesn't it? Because there is no guarding of the cherubim. What did our, our verse say? It says, and its gates will never be shut by day. There's no need for it to be guarded. Why? Because nothing detestable, nothing sinful, nothing unclean is ever going to enter this city. Nothing will enter this temple that is an abomination to the Lord. And so there's no need to, for it to be guarded by cherubim. But what will the cherubim do? They will continue to praise God forever. You have this aspect of priesthood, this aspect of a royal priesthood. What will we do? What will Israel do? What will all saints do forever in this temple? We will reign as a royal priesthood, the image of God restored. The priests were commanded to work and keep the tabernacle. The same principle, we will be commanded to reign, to work, to keep. Not keep in the sense of it fading because the Garden of Eden didn't fade, but the sense of pouring out our creativity unto the glory of God. The further in you go, the closer to life, holiness, and God. This isn't exactly true either, is it? Because the whole place is a place of holiness, a place of God, a place of life. It is perfect perfection, so there's no need to go in deeper to get to these things because the whole thing is it. At the same time, there's also the tree of life there. It is a good place. Though we don't have a declaration of good, though we don't really have a declaration of finished other than the end of Revelation where it says, amen, let it be so. It is a place that is good. And when Jesus finishes his work after the millennium and he closes vision and prophets, it will be finished. Everything will be finished. There will be no need for prophets and there will just be the royal priesthood. And there's an aspect of rest after completion. We discussed how we will have a final rest and how Joshua makes the argument based off of what David says that Joshua did not give Israel the promised land, that he did not give them the true rest that was promised. Why? Because Israel fell back into sin again and again and again. And so war and takeovers of the land came again and again and again. That won't happen in heaven because it will be a place of perfect rest. 
And so uh, you could take all of these and in some aspect or form are connected with the new temple, that being the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb in the new heavens and the new earth. And if it's not a direct parallel, it's a contrast to say this is even greater. And again, as we have looked at for several weeks, Scripture draws us back to the perfect. We're spending this time looking through creation because there's all these parallels we see in these different aspects that are taking us back to the new, are taking us forward to the new heavens and the new earth, where Scripture is all about trying to get us back to this perfect because we have Genesis 3 and we have Genesis 4, and the corruption that follows after that goes throughout the whole Bible. But throughout that corruption, there is a some called the scarlet thread in which Jesus comes and dies for our sins. And when Jesus came and died for us, when Jesus came and died for us, he did a great work in us. He made us spiritually dead creatures alive together with Christ, for by grace we have been saved. Not of our own doing, not of our own works, but through his work. Through his work. And Scripture is drawing us back to this perfect, but we also see that in our redemption, we see something very interesting. We see we are God's temple. We are God's temple. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 say, Do you not know that you are God's temple? And that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. We as believers are the temple of God, Let's go back to what is a temple. It's a place of God's presence. It's a place where God dwells. It's a sanctuary. And what does Paul say here? And that God's spirit dwells in you. And so the the sign of the new covenant is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. God's perfect law being written on our hearts as the spirit indwells in us. That is the sign and the promise of the new covenant. It is also the seal that we will one day go and be in this new heavens and new earth. As Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 4 argue, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee. It is the down payment of our redemption. And as Paul says in Philippians 1, 6, that he who began a good work in us is faithful to bring it to completion. And so this new covenant is God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. What is that a picture of? It's a picture of the tabernacle. It is a picture of the temple. It is a picture of Mount Sinai where Moses was up on the mountain and God's presence was there. What did Moses ask God? God, please show me your glory. And God says, no man can see my face and live, but God in his mercy and his grace towards Moses shows him his back. But Sinai was a picture of a place where God's spirit dwelt, where God's presence was. Same with the temple, same with Eden. It's the same in our hearts And because of that, we are a light to the world that shines God's presence because we are God's temple. And the gospel is the promise of this. It's an amazing promise. It's an amazing truth. When Jesus said, he will never leave us nor forsake us, he meant it literally because he put the Holy Spirit in us. And the Holy Spirit abides in us for maybe 100 years, maybe 20 years, maybe 50 years, uh, maybe until... The world decides to snuff out the church. No, I will put my spirit in you forever. Forever. I will put my spirit in you forever. When God says forever, do we mean it believes forever? Do we believe that? When God said to David, your offspring will reign forever, he meant forever. It wasn't for a short time that got cut off in 70 AD. That promise was not just a promise to David. It was a promise to Jesus. Forever. The promise to Abraham that his offspring would inherit this land forever. Was that a promise to just Abraham? No, it was also a promise to Jesus. Was it for a period of time until 70 AD, until Assyria destroyed Israel, when Babylon took over Israel, when Rome did that? Is, is, is that when it ends? No, it's forever. So when God says, I'll put my spirit in you forever, it is forever. It's forever. And the gospel is the promise of this. The gospel is the promise of this. But if we don't believe in the gospel, if we reject this truth, if we don't have faith, does God's spirit dwell in us? No. And we're walking contrary to the Lord. And we don't have time to go into this because it'd be an extensive topic all on its own. But every time you see salvation in the Bible, you can be sure there's always an aspect of destruction. Every time you see salvation, there's always an aspect of destruction. Israel was saved at the Red Sea from the hand of the Egyptians. 
because Egypt was destroyed. As we looked into a little bit this morning, God destroyed the army of Assyria when Israel was, as Mr. Armstrong says, as good as dead outside the walls of Jerusalem. You have this massive army that can destroy Jerusalem. They've destroyed everything else in, in Judah. And yet, the angel of the Lord comes down and brings salvation to Israel by destroying 185,000 Assyrians outside of the walls of Jerusalem. And even our salvation came at a great cost. It came at the destruction of Christ's body. The wrath of God being poured down upon him, it became at the destruction of sin and death itself. And I don't know who said it originally, but I love it. Death was destroyed by death. And the gospel is this picture of salvation through the hand of destruction. But what happens if we reject this salvation? Then the destruction is upon us. And the Bible is very clear about that, that the eternal consequence is hell. It is separation from God. If you desire to not be God's temple, to have his spirit dwell in you, to have his presence with you, if you do not desire that, but walk away and reject him and reject his presence, then God says, I reject you forever. But those who accept him, who accept the redeeming blood of Christ the promise of salvation God's Spirit put in us is forever, meaning we will live forever with Him. We have eternal life, and we can be sure of that because the Spirit placed in us is the down payment of our inheritance. And if you put a down payment down, then it will be brought to completion, as Paul also says. And so we are God's temple. Eden was a place of a temple. The new heavens and the new earth is a place of the temple. But right now, we are the picture of that And so we should go out into the whole world and declare the sanctuary to the world because they are in need of the same redemption. We're going to pray, and then I have a short video to close. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this imagery of the temple that we have throughout the Bible. Lord, this imagery is an image of you being a relational God. It is the imagery of you longing to have a relationship with us. And though you cast out Adam and Eve from the garden, Lord, you still built the tabernacle and you still built the temple because you long to have a relationship with us. The covenants themselves, Lord, as you have shown us, are also their covenants of rest and their covenants of your relationship with us. And Lord, we thank you that this new covenant is greater than the old covenants of Moses because it brings us salvation. Lord, we thank you that you have placed our, your spirits in us. You have breathed into us new life in the same way that you breathed life into Adam. Lord, I pray that we would act in a way that is glorifying and, and honoring to you, that we would share your word, Lord, because the consequence of not coming to you, of longing to be separated from you, is very dire. It leads to a place that is described as with bitter regrets and gnashing of teeth. Lord, I pray we would be faithful to the call to go out from there, from here and proclaim your word. Lord, that you are a God who is loving, that you are a God who is relational, but Lord, you are also a God of wrath who will not let evil stand forever. And Lord, you have promised that one day there will be an end to evil. We will have to fear no more, and we will have perfect peace and rest in you, in your new temple, in the new heavens and the new earth, because, Lord, you are the temple. You are the light forever. I thank you for that. I pray your blessings upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus paid it all.